Chinese Foreign Minister Wang Yi visits Washington. What impact can we expect for China-U.S. relations? Hello, I'm Arun Naidu and this is The Heat. The Chinese Foreign Minister Wang Yi is on a three-day visit to the United States. He's holding talks with his counterpart, the U.S. Secretary of State Anthony Blinken. Wang Yi also met with President Biden at the White House on Friday and met with National Security Advisor Jake Sullivan. The Foreign Minister is promoting better communication to achieve improved China-U.S. ties. China and the United States need to have dialogue. Not only should we resume a dialogue, the dialogue should be in-depth and comprehensive, so that with dialogue, we can increase mutual understanding, reduce misunderstandings and misjudgment, constantly seek to expand common ground and seek cooperation that will benefit to both sides, so that we can stabilize China-U.S. relations and retrieve it to the track of healthy, stable and sustainable development. To discuss China-U.S. relations, let's bring in our panel. From Beijing, Victor Gao is chair professor at Soochow University. From Guangzhou, Andy Mok is a senior research fellow at the Center for China and Globalization. Robert Hormatz is a visiting lecturer at Yale University and former U.S. Under Secretary of State. He joins us from New York and right here in our studio. Saurabh Gupta is senior Asia-Pacific international relations policy specialist at the Institute for China-America Studies. Welcome to all of you. Victor, let me start with you uh, and look at how this relationship has been progressing over the past few months. Uh, over the summer, we saw a steady stream of uh, United States officials visiting Beijing. They ranged from the Secretary of State, the Treasury Secretary, as well as the Commerce Secretary. Right now, we have uh, the governor of California, Gavin Newsom. He is uh, in Beijing for a one-week visit. Um, and, of course, we have the Chinese foreign minister right now in Washington holding talks with uh, the president and other senior officials in the Biden administration. What does this tell you? Is this a thawing of relationships, a softening, perhaps? Thank you very much for having me. I think so long as China and the United States wants to promote uh, good relations and try to avoid a major confrontation or further deterioration of the bilateral relations, the more such high-level meetings there will be, the better. And uh, it should not just stop with this uh, current level of exchanges, or even, for example, the uh, summit meeting between President Biden or President Xi Jinping on the sideline of the APEC in San Francisco uh, very soon, next month. I personally hope there should be an exchange of state visits by President Biden to China in his official capacity, and on a re reciprocal basis, President Xi Jinping's state visit to Washington. That, I hope, will really bring to a culmination of the uh, normalization of relations between these two greatest countries in the world, the two largest economies in the world. And I think we should not stop here. We should really do our best to make sure that China and the United States will continue to work together, to get along together, to live and let live, and make sure that the world is not going out of control or wars in different parts of the world will break out to harm the fundamental interest, not only of the American people, but also of the Chinese people and people in so many other countries. Now, the great responsibility rests on the shoulder of China and the United States. Whatever we are witnessing in terms of the improvement of the relations is a very important step in the right direction. But we should not stop here. We should make bigger strides in this right direction. And, Victor, when you talk about normalization, I mean, what would you like to see in the short term? Well, in the short term, first of all, uh, the two countries should engage in such dialogue uh, as frequently as possible. And either side should stop uh, provoking the other side, especially on matters of fundamental national interest. And we should also identify a short list of red uh, button issues, for example, and both sides need to demonstrate sensitivity and caring for the fundamental interest of the other side, rather than 
take great joy in provoking the other side, as if, for example, the further deterioration of the relations will work for anyone's benefit. In this context, allow me to emphasize, Governor Newsom of California made a very important visit to China. What mattered the most is this high level of pragmatism and realism that he brought to China-U.S. relations. And I do hope more governors, more members of Congress, including senators, as well as representatives, uh, cabinet members, for example, they need to come to China. And reciprocally, the Chinese officials need to go to Washington and other parts of the United States to see with their own eyes right. what these two countries are. And on a people-to-people -people level, the Chinese people and the American people should not be enemies against each other. We could really do so much together uh -huh. to make sure that the world we will be leaving for our future generations will be a better world. Andy Mock, uh, how do you see this relationship uh, evolving, not just in terms of bilateral relations, but also addressing some of the major issues in the world? These are two superpowers that we are talking about right now, and we have the ongoing Ukraine conflict, we have the ongoing Israeli onslaught on Gaza, that's after Hamas uh, attacked Israeli civilians on October the 7th. Um, what does China bring to this? No, that's such a great question, Anand. Let me preface this by saying that I agree with my good friend Victor Gao that these the optics matter a lot. And if uh, President Biden can visit China, there can be more high-level engagement. This is certainly uh, important from a symbolic perspective. And Gavin Newsom's visit, not just to Beijing, but Shenzhen, I think, in particular, is vitally important. And there should be much more of this with the governors, perhaps, of Florida and Texas in particular, I think, seeing firsthand for themselves what China's really like. And this plays into the broader geopolitical problems that you mentioned, Anand. What struck me most about uh, Wang Yi's comments uh, in Washington is that it is not the strongest arm or the loudest voice uh, that determines who's right. And whatever happens, China will respond calmly. Uh, the facts will win out at the end of the day, and history will render a just verdict. So we see the problems in Ukraine, in Israel, a very real risk of this uh, escalating in potentially catastrophic ways. And I think I see uh, echoes of this in other uh, problems that have erupted over the years with regard to China, whether we're looking at uh, uh, the Uyghur situation in Xinjiang or in Hong Kong, uh, that China's resolute and calm approach uh, has shown its confidence uh, in its, its way of thinking, its uh, mode of solving international problems, whether this is at the UN or on a bilateral basis. And certainly, uh, these, con these conflicts in Ukraine and uh, in the Middle East have regional, local causes uh, that really outside parties can only affect in a limited way. Um, but that being said, I think every country certainly has an interest, and the United States and China in particular I think do need to take an objective, even-handed approach that does not uh, overly focus on one side, because that's ultimately counterproductive. Sarah, great to have you in the studio with us. Um, looking at all these visits by U.S. officials to China, and now, of course, the Foreign Minister Wang Yi's visit to Washington for very high-level talks, are we reaching something of a turning point, or is that a bit too early to say that? I think we have reached a turning point. Uh, how, how important that turning point is in the larger scheme of things, it's hard to say right now, especially with 2024 being an election year. But I think how far we've come since uh, the balloon incident, I think is a sign that the two sides really want to get there, uh, want to stabilize the relationship. You know, they talked that, about that in Bali last year, and frankly, the, the stabilization process would have moved much further had that unfortunate incident not happened. But I have seen both sides being disciplined in their communications with each other. There have obviously been exchanges of visit. We have to remember, the congressional delegation was a very important thing. Uh, Congress is the harshest branch of government mm -hmm. when it comes to China. 
the Republicans are probably more anti-China than at any time since the McCarthy who lost Taiwan debate. And yet we had three senators go, three Republican senators go. So I think uh, that definitely provides cover for P President Biden to engage Mr. Xi and to see Governor Newsom go and go so, so enthusiastically at a time when a lot of people in the Beltway think uh, we, do not, we don't want to touch the Chinese with a barge pole even. And here he was going. So I think we have turned a corner. Yeah. I'd like to see progress at this meeting in terms of deliverables which are, can be achieved. Mm -hmm. But in the larger scheme of things, uh, the election year is important. And if you have a change in government and a change in party, everything could be just it could be dissipated. So it's, it's premature to me. That's right. That's the four-year cycle that uh, yeah. we face. One other point, sir, Robin, that is China is now, you see the outreach from China in terms of making a contribution to peace around the world, to stabilizing flashpoints around the world. There was a special envoy from China in the Middle East. China also attended the peace summit that took place in Cairo right after this latest round of um, fighting in, um, between the Israelis and the Palestinians. Um, what do you make of that? I think it's welcome. Uh, I don't think, again, we should be getting too far ahead out here. Mm -hmm. China has, has it, it's, it's important that China shoulder public goods burden in mm -hmm. terms of international security responsibilities. China comes in with different perspectives on these matters. And so it helps sort of balance the conversation rather than if just one party, the West, was there and trying to dictate events. Mm -hmm. And the West has leverage, but up to a point only. It's important, but also we must understand China's leverage and ability in certain situations mm -hmm. is limited. Its policies also go up to a point, yeah. and it's not going to necessarily support certain policies with mm -hmm. regard to even in terms of what's happening today in the, in the Middle East. But I think it's a trend that ought to be welcomed. Good to see China, and it's done it in Afghanistan, Myanmar also try to be a facilitator as such rather than, than get beyond. But I would submit the best thing China and the US can do is stabilize their relationship. Relationship. Right. I think that is the ultimate public good for the global global system. Robert Holman, it's great to have you with us. So we have seen rising tensions between the two countries, China and the United States, over the past few years. Uh, but there have also been efforts to ease those tensions. Uh, where do you think it's heading right now? Well, I think that it is heading in a f much more positive way than it was six months ago or so. Um, the tone in Washington was sort of an angry tone. Politicians thought they were getting a lot of political credit with their constituents by making tough statements on China. Um, I think that was totally counterproductive in the relationship and achieved nothing um, and was unhealthy in terms of moving uh, ahead on difficult issues. Now I think we're seeing a very different and much better tone mm with all these visits, the Secretary of State, Secretary of the Treasury, Secretary of Commerce, John Kerry, um, Schumer, and now Governor Newsom. I think this is a very important signal to the American people that senior politicians uh, on both sides, the Chinese side and the American side, thought that the, the, the anger of the debate had gone too far and they want to pull it back um, for two reasons. One, because they understand that really nothing can get done of significance in the global economic system or the global political system or on global security issues without China and the U.S. working together. And second, because I think they want to signal to the American public that we need to work with China. We need to find areas of cooperation with China, and there are several. Uh, the environment is one cooperation we've had for years on medical and health issues, major breakthroughs between American scientists and Chinese scientists uh, uh, on, on key issues. Right. And there are a whole range of other issues uh, where, we, where we can and need to work together to avoid this deteriorating and to continue what I think is now a positive direction. And I, I'm very happy that the Chinese leaders and the American leaders have uh, decided on ways of working together and improving this dialogue. 
And Robert, what about domestic political consideration and uh, considerations rather, and how it impacts the relationship between China and the United States? I mean, Sir Rob just mentioned a moment ago that the harshest branch of the United States government when it comes to this relationship is the United States Congress. And recently, we had two Republican representatives that criticized the White House for hosting the Chinese foreign minister. They described it as a weakness on the part of the Biden administration. I mean, to what extent does this deeply polarized political environment that we are in right now um, hinder better relations? Well, it is harmful. Uh, it is harmful. Um, first of all, negotiation and working together is not a sign of weakness. I, I think it's a sign of understanding the world as it is today, where you have two major powers with enormous human talent and a lot of uh, capabilities deciding that they want to work together. And I don't see that as a sign of weakness. I see it as a sign of positive progress. And I applaud the leaders on both sides who have uh, seen it in much the same way. Um, I think the politics in the U.S. have been unhelpful, um, but that is largely in Washington. If you go to various parts of the country, you don't see that in the same way. You, the farm community likes to work with the Chinese. They sell a lot of grain to China and other products. California, technological cooperation, entertainment cooperation, and agricultural cooperation in New York. Uh, Chuck Schumer went, and the U.S. Uh, and, and the Chinese financial communities, and of course New York's the center of the U.S. financial community, have been working together. So I actually think that if you go out to the various parts of the country, there is a much more positive view yeah. of China than there is in Washington. Washington, I think it's, it's political rhetoric in various parts of the country. It's practical cooperation. And I think most people who understand China, and I've been going since 1972 when I was Dr. Kissinger's advisor as we were just beginning the relationship. Right. Uh, right. I, I was convinced at that point, as I am convinced now, <laughs> that the two countries actually can work together and that the world will be a far better place if they find ways of doing that. And certainly they need to find ways of avoiding a deterioration, and I think they are working to do that, and I think they've made a lot of progress to avoid further deterioration and move the path yeah. on toward greater progress. And I'm I'm, I'm delighted because I've spent a lot of my lifetime in in, in doing this and trying to right. achieve right. this progress. And now I see Tony Blinken and uh, Janet Yellen and a new number of other people. And, the, and I think the president at some point is going to realize that yeah. being negative to China doesn't help him politically, and working with China will be a, an asset. Yeah. Victor, you know, we've been talking about the visit by the California Gover Ga Governor Gavin Newsom to China. He's uh, going to be there for a week, as I said. Well, he's been talking to the media, and this is some of what he had to say. Let's listen. Some people see the world from a scarcity frame, zero sum. I don't. I see. The more successful China is, the more successful we all will be. It's just about competition, raises everyone's game. But zero sum, I completely reject that framework. So, Victor, listening to Gavin Newsom there, do you think that is something of a message he's sending to the current administration? I hope so. And I uh, do believe that uh, Governor Newsom's uh, message to uh, the White House, to the Beltway in Washington, D.C., and to the American people at large will be viewed as a very positive one. Why? Because he's talking about the truth. He's talking about what he's seen in China, what is gathered, uh, talking with the Chinese leaders, not only in Beijing, but elsewhere in China. And I think he is being very pragmatic and very realistic. And I think this is exactly what's needed. Now, we also talked about the U.S. Congress. I have a dream of bringing all members of the Congress, both in the Senate and in the House of Representatives, to visit China every year so that they can have a better understanding of what China is. As Governor Newsom is telling the American people, I do believe that Governor Newsom is acting for the best interest of the American people, of the people in California, and for the businesses of all kinds in the United States. In the world of today, China is a fact. China is a megatrend. You need to accept that as a fact, rather than to fight against it for mutual destruction. 
And I do hope Governor Newsom will be viewed very positively in the United States for his courage, vision, and wisdom of telling the American people about the truth about China. Andy, we've seen a lot of reports uh, over the past few weeks on the likelihood of a meeting between President Xi Jinping and President Biden uh, at the uh, APEC uh, meeting, which takes place next month, on the sidelines of that meeting. Uh, there was an op-ed which was uh, published in the South China Morning Post and was written by Stephen Roach of Yale University. And he said that that likely meeting, which will take place in San Francisco, will be mainly a photo op. Uh, but what it... Uh, what must follow that meeting uh, is the creation of China-U.S. working groups to move the relationship forward, to deal with things on, um, on, in details, on a detailed basis. What are your thoughts on that? Well, I agree with him. I think that uh, certainly if there is a meeting in San Francisco, uh, it will be uh, a fantastic photo op, but we shouldn't uh, discount that. Again, the optics matter. Symbolism matters a lot. I would, though, strike a note of caution in that at the same time, uh, the U.S. is making uh, very serious efforts at multiple levels to engage with China publicly. At the same time, behind the scenes, it is also uh, looking to discourage American investment in China. And of course, we've seen uh, new semiconductor restrictions as well. So I think this is very, very counterproductive and frankly undermines uh, American competitiveness, as I think we've seen Governor Newsom mention as well. So, you know, some of the most important uh, companies in California are the semiconductor companies, and they are losing out. NVIDIA's uh, CEO has mentioned uh, his concern about losing access to the China market, which would undermine their ability to invest uh, in R&D. So I think this is uh, an important consideration uh, to bear in mind. The other thing about APEC, too, is, of course, I think that technology is going to be uh, one of the topics discussed, and semiconductors is a very important part of that. With regard to working groups, we're already seeing, uh, I think, very good progress. Uh, Secretary of Treasury Yellen said that with the uh, financial working groups, that uh, I believe in her words uh, that the U.S.-China relationship has moved past a dangerous phase. So certainly, I think these uh, lower-level engagements are happening at the national level. And if they're complemented uh, by more subnational engagement, on the U.S. side in particular, I think that's important. The last thing I want to say is that uh, voices like uh, Michael Mafal, who's the, uh, I believe, the, the most critical in terms of criticizing this engagement uh, yeah. with China, yeah. Uh, I think really it represents outdated and obsolete thinking. And I'm optimistic long term because when we look at this by age cohort, uh, certainly younger people have a much more realistic understanding of the United States yeah. uh, in the world today. And I think no longer have this notion of a hegemonic, uh, the U.S. is and should be number one. Um, so I think in the long term, uh, we do have some cause right. for optimism, but in the right. short term, uh, there is still some concern. You know, sort of one of the words we heard very often in the last few months was decoupling. The United States talking about decoupling from the Chinese economy. That was recast as de-risking. Um, now, many analysts see that as sort of code language for uh, containing China, for blocking its rise, continuing rise as an economic power. Um, is that something that's going to be addressed by the foreign minister when he's here? Uh, I don't think so. I know both uh, it, the United States is going to try to reassure China that we are not seeking decoupling. In every visit that has happened, Blinken, Raimondo, Yellen, I think even Secretary Kerry said, he said, we are not seeking to decouple. And they talk in terms of secure, uh, supply chain resilience and certain national security elements. Uh, I'm not totally uh, believing in that. I think there is a tendency to seek selective decoupling. And actually, the, those in the Republican Party would like to make it a much more broader decoupling. Well, the Europeans genuinely are de-risking in terms of yeah. le lessening the over-dependence in the relationship. But I think there are 
useful areas where this summit can 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 achieve deliverables. I think they're tra talking about a 1.5 track on AI, setting up a working group. Yeah. I think that's absolutely doable. I think they will probably have agreements. I'm hoping China will agree to restart mill mill conversations. Mm -hmm. That's the part one working group which has not happened. I think there's a chance to tee up something on fentanyl also. Both yeah. sides know what they want. They're speaking in a working group. I, I don't know where the situation is, so they could yeah. do something on fentanyl. The one area I think they will not realize forward progress is some, on their science and technology yeah. agreement, which is due to expire okay. or temporarily renewed. But I'm hoping the two presidents will invest their political capital to see that this does get done right. down the line. Robert Holmans, I've just got a couple of minutes left, but I want to talk about technology, particularly uh, we've heard that the foreign minister, uh, the visiting foreign minister, Wang Yi, will try to get the restrictions that have been put on sales of semiconductors to China lifted. Um, but if we look at what's happened recently, uh, recently the U.S. doubled down uh, on these restrictions uh, to block the sale of its semiconductors to China. Officials said it wants to, they said it want to, they want to close down loopholes to the existing arrangements. Um, where do you see that go? Well, I think there is a view in Washington that uh, high technology is both an economic matter and has uh, security implications as well. And I think that's one of the difficulties. Um, if it were just that the, the high technology that was being sold was uh, uh, an economic phenomenon that boosted economic trade and, and investment, I think the emotions wouldn't be as great as they are because a lot of people, including people in the Pentagon and other parts of the administration, think that if you sell China high technology, it will be used not just for economic purposes, but for security purposes. And I think that um, that's what has clouded the debate or confused the debate or, or crossed the, the lines in the debate, so it's blurred the lines. I think we, what one of the conversations that's required is to try to figure out a way that we can develop a security relationship mm. of trust so that people are not as concerned that technology will be used for adverse purposes by either side. Um, and I think what we need to do is to try to figure out how to, in Jake Sullivan's words, um, find a way where there are there are almost certainly going to be some restrictions, yeah. but minimize those restrictions to the point that they're not going to interfere with a wider range of technology which has economic purposes but not security purposes. Somewhere along the though that the lines of that debate, right. it's important. And right. I think trust is important and conversations are important. And the more these bilateral conversations occur, the, the higher the level of trust. And I think the greater the prospect of okay. avoiding undue interference in technology that does not have security concerns attached to it, but it's yeah. simply an economic phenomenon. Okay, and that is where we are going to have to leave it. We've run out of time. That is it for this edition of The Heat. Thank you to everyone for being with us. I'm Arnand Naidu in Washington, D.C.